Hey, my name is Brian Fisher here with Isotope, and today I'm going to be talking about recording and mixing bass guitar recorded through a DI and techniques to sculpt a great bass sound. So bass guitar recorded through a DI on its own can sound pretty dull, plain, and lifeless, but with the right processing, you can completely transform a bass sound and add excitement and power to it. I'm going to show you some ways to do that with Neutron and Neoverb. And first off, DI stands for Direct Input or Direct Injection. You might have a DI box like this one, or you might be plugging directly into your interface's high impedance input. Either way, the goal is to directly capture the sound coming from your bass guitar. The reason you might want to do this is because honestly, most home recordists don't have the space and the proper gear to mic their bass amp, or they might have neighbors that would complain from the noise like I do. Either way, it's gonna be way more convenient to record through a bass DI. All right, so first things first, we wanna set our levels and make sure that we're not coming in too hot. The bass guitar is a super dynamic instrument and it's really easy to end up clipping if you're not careful. So I typically try to make sure that my loudest peaks are landing somewhere around minus 10, minus 12 dBFS. All right, levels are good. Here we go. All right, so now we have our bass track recorded. We're gonna be working on a song that I wrote called Simple Life, and we're gonna pull up Neutron to get started. So if you're not sure where to start with mixing bass or any instrument for that matter, you can always go to the Mix Assistant, Track Enhance, and it'll automatically listen to your audio and create a custom preset for you. So let's do that to start with. I'm gonna hit Next, and for Style, let's keep that balanced. Intensity Medium sounds good and we'll leave it on auto detect for the instrument and play that back. All right, as you can see, Sculptor identified the correct instrument as bass and added a few more modules like the equalizer, exciter, and a couple instances of compression. I'm just gonna do a quick before and after. Keep in mind, this is gonna be pretty subtle because it's just a starting point. So here is without processing. So this is super helpful as a starting point. You can obviously go in from here and tweak all of these modules individually to get the sound you like. For this tutorial, I kind of know what I have in mind. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove these modules and we're gonna start from scratch. All right, so let's start with Sculptor and we'll go down to Bass. And Sculptor is an amazing module to start with because it automatically uses EQ and dynamics processing to reshape your sound to an ideal target. You'll notice that there's a little slider here that goes from zero to 100. That determines the intensity of processing. We also have a tone dial for a darker or brighter sound and speed, which controls the attack and release variables of the dynamics processing. So I'm gonna play that back so you can hear what it's doing. All right, so already that's sounding much better. So let's go to compression. I like to do serial compression on bass because bass is notoriously dynamic and hard to control. So I approach it in two different stages. The first is a fast attack, fast release compression used to attenuate some of the loudest peaks in the signal. So I'm gonna go to peak mode and vintage mode which basically adds just a little bit more color and character. I'm gonna set the attack down to one millisecond, release to about 50 milliseconds, ratio four to one, 
and auto gain on. And we're gonna dial in maybe one to three dB of compression on some of the loudest peaks. Awesome, so that just creates a little bit more headroom. And then for the second compressor, we're gonna do a bit of a slower attack. I like to do like an opto compressor or you know, in this case, an RMS. I'm gonna set that to about a 12 millisecond attack, keep that at 100 and do a four to one ratio and dial in a bit more compression on this to really control the signal. Typically around five to six dB gain reduction is good. I'm gonna back off that attack a bit more. Okay, now we have a controlled and consistent bass performance without the peaks being totally squashed and we can do some saturation. Saturation is great for bass guitar because it helps your bass cut through a dense mix. And it's also crucial so that you can hear the bass on smaller speakers with less frequency response. One of the great things about Neutron is that you can do multi-band processing for a more subtle effect. So I like to do a little bit less saturation on the low end than the high end in order to preserve the dynamics of the low end. And then for the upper band, I like to really drive that in distortion and then mix it in parallel. So I'm gonna to go to tube saturation and let's start with the upper band. Now that's a pretty exaggerated sound. It's almost sounding like an electric guitar now, but we have this high end attenuation band here so we can cut some of that harshness that's being generated. Now I'm gonna take back this wet dry slider and find a nice blend where it's not super obvious distortion, but it's helping bring a little bit more presence to the bass guitar. All right, now for the low band, I'm gonna dial in some tube saturation, but keep it much more subtle. So let's solo this band here. All right, next, let's do some EQ. So I typically always apply a high pass and a low pass filter on bass guitar. The high pass filter, I'm just trying to filter out some of the sub frequencies that are gonna be competing with the kick drum. Now this depends a lot on the relationship between the kick and the bass. But in this song, I know that I want the kick drum to really kind of dominate that 50 to 60 Hertz region. And then for the high frequency roll off, I'm just trying to get rid of some of that extra kind of attack and you know fret noise. Basically, it's just clutter that we don't really need. I'm gonna play this back and slide this around until I'm preserving just what I wanna hear in the mix. And I'm using a gentle slope of 12 dB per octave to avoid any ringing or phase issues that might arise. All right, another thing I like to do with my bass DI recordings is boost some of the low end. Now this is totally dependent on your bass guitar and kind of what it needs in context, but mine always feels a little bit thin, like it needs a little bit more warmth and fullness in the low end. So typically around 200 Hertz, I'll grab a low shelf and I'll play back the bass in context and kind of bring it up until it feels full and filled out in the mix. It's sounding good to me. Another thing I like to do is bring up a little bit of presence. I usually like to sweep around about 650 hertz to one kilohertz and find a nice kind of 
nasally presence that helps the bass cut through the mix. All right, the next frequency area I want to look at is between 300 and 500. I can often get kind of some ugly, muddy, wooly frequencies in the bass that, I don't know, just sound kind of unnatural or unpleasant to my ear. So I'm going to actually solo the bass and try to pinpoint the frequency that uh, is bothering me. And using the solo band function, I can listen to exactly what I'm cutting. Now the next thing I want to talk about is masking. Masking occurs when two sounds sharing similar frequencies are played at the same time. Where the frequencies overlap, the louder of the two will dominate, making it difficult to hear the nuances of the quieter sound. Now Neutron has a built-in masking meter, so I can look at, say, the relationship of the bass guitar and the kick drum, or really any other instrument that has an instance of Neutron on it. And as I play this back, you're gonna see different areas highlighted in orange where there's conflicting frequencies that may be causing masking. So I'm gonna solo the drums and the bass and play this back for a minute. So as you might expect, this area here right around 50 to 60 hertz is kind of our problem area. So I'm gonna add an extra band here and attenuate that a few dB. And if you find that your cut is taking too much low end power out of the bass, another thing you can do is make it dynamic and side chain it to the kick so that every time the kick hits, it pushes down that band. So all you have to do is hit side chain here I'm gonna click external, full signal, and I'm gonna go up and choose the kick bus for the side chain for this plugin. All right, so I'm gonna do a before and after with the side chain. Here is before. All right, now we're gonna add some ambience with Neoverb. The reason I like to add a little bit of ambience to a bass DI sound is just to give it a sense of life and dimension like it exists in a physical space. Obviously, we didn't record with a real bass amp in a room, so this is in order to fake that a little bit. So we're gonna to go to Reverb Assistant and dial in a pretty subtle short reverb. So I'm gonna play this back in solo and experiment with these parameters in real time to find a tone that fits the track. I think that works well. I'm gonna hit next and play this back and it's gonna unmask the reverb tail for me applying pre and post EQ cuts. accept and the first thing I like to do is go to the post reverb EQ and add a high pass filter. The reason I like to do this is because I want to get rid of any reverb happening in the low end and make sure that the low end of the bass feels focused and mono and that it sort of blooms into stereo in the higher frequencies. And what I'm going to do here is play it back, bring the send all the way to zero and kind of slowly bring it in until there's just enough to give it a sense of space without it being obvious that we added reverb. So here's the bass in solo with all of the processing bypassed.
Thank you so much for watching. As always, head over to isotope.com if you want to try out any of the tools that I used in this tutorial. Have fun producing, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.